Jai Bharat and welcome to Dev Talks. This is Adi Achind. Once again, I have with me Jennifer Zeng from Inconvenient Truths about China. She's been doing some amazing work, and I will talk to her about a fascinating piece of news that she did some time ago about a Wuhan scientist who told her the real story of something that we all suffered with COVID. But before that. I want to get into a couple of other things with regards to China, which Xi Jinping's purges, which continue. We know the story of Qing Gang by now, and I have spoken about this on the channel with her and Chris Chappell as well. Uh, we need to know what's happening within the army because, to me, if the Communist Party of China needs to go or needs to get subdued, the only organization in China that can actually do it. Is the army. So, Jennifer, hello and welcome. Thank you so much for taking out the time. I am really grateful that you're being participative in sharing your truths with India, and it'll be really nice to hear you once again on the show. Thank you. Yes, I, several days ago, I think I reported a piece of news about the major purge within the rocket force. So, from its commander.、Uh, Several deputy commander and a former deputy deputy commander, including the former minister of national defense and one deputy commander of the、uh, another、uh, another force called a strategic support force, were all、uh, under either investigation or have already or already committed suicide. So this is a huge, huge purge. Actually, this is only what. Has been reported on what we know, according to a former PLA、uh, Navy colonel, Mr. Yao Chen, hundreds of generals in inside the PLA army have been purged in the recent in the recent you know purge movement. So Xi Jinping obviously has lost contrast with these generals that he himself personally. Promoted because he has been in power for over ten years, right?、Uh, he had、uh, actually since he took、uh, power, he had already purged、uh, some major top top level CCP military、um, personnel that was appointed by his、uh, by Jiang Zemin, you know, before the the leaders before him. So, but this time he again feel like. As、uh, insecure again, I think the one of the main issue, according to Mr. Yao Chen, was you know last year,、uh, in October, the、um, Air Force,、um, the Air、uh, Force Academy of the United States, published a very very detailed report about the rocket force of. Of the PLA, hundreds of pages with all sorts of very detailed information of the rocket force. It seems this is the U.S. has already know everything about the rocket force. So according to Yao Chen, they this was this kind of information. You know, you can't gather、uh, from the satellite because they have even the English and the Chinese names. Of the you know very basic basic level of all the units inside the rocket force, including those cooking you know <laughs> units, so this kind of information could only be released by someone inside、uh, the, the the rocket force. And according to Mr. Yao Chen,、uh, the volunteer really released. This not 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 just for money, but、uh, also because they didn't they they don't want want to fight the U.S. So so they they hope that by releasing all the information now the U.S. knows very well you know where the、uh, launching、uh, you know points or sites of the rocket force are how many you know.、Uh, Rockets they have and where they are, how many personnel, who is in which unit, or including the logistic unit, they know everything. So maybe <laughs> this they want they they want to do this to stop、uh, the Xi Jinping's ambition to attack Taiwan, and also 
uh, Yao Chen also revealed that actually in 19, 2019, uh, the CCP did a military drill, or you can say simulation to take Taiwan. They, they did it with uh, some kind of island in, in Shandong province, which is very similar to Taiwan. But the result of that uh, simulation was actually the CCP lost. The, Tai the Taiwan actually army won that battle. So from that time, the CCP's military um, personnel, you can say, uh, really had a different thought about taking over Taiwan with force. But because Xi Jinping's, you know, he was able to gain his third team only because he had made a promise or commitment to the CCP elders that he would take back Taiwan with force during his time in office. That's the condition and precondition uh, why he was given uh, ex ex you know, extraordinary uh, third term. Before him, everyone got two terms and you, you, you step down, right? You got another person to take over, but he is the first uh, to have a third term. And so, so he has this uh, a com commitment or the mission to take over Taiwan. So I guess maybe because he was pushing very hard, but the military personnel uh, had some kind of resistance because they knew very well if ever the war started, the, the first batch of people who die were, would be the military staff, especially mm. the rocket force. They figured they, the U.S. would try to destroy the the missiles of the CCP army first. So the rocket force will be the first to be targeted and uh, could lose their life. Uh, so that's why th there is a resistance. And just, I think, two days ago, uh, because there was rumors in the beginning of July that Wu Guohua, the deputy, uh, a deputy commander of rocket force committed suicide, but there was no news at, at all. But only 21 days after his death, there was a, a news and a, a arbitrary uh, announced that that he did. He really, according to the official news, he died of some kind of illness uh, in his home in Beijing in on July 4th. But the question is, if he really died of illness, that's a normal death. Why they delayed for 21 days to announce his death? So, so from this, we can be pretty much sure that he did commit suicide because of, I think, uh, purge-related issues. So, so yeah, we we should keep on watching what's happening. I think this is a very interesting development, and uh, this, of course, is a huge uh, blow uh, to the uh, Xi Jinping's ambition to to take Taiwan. Yeah, that's. I mean, I can't believe something like this because this is. It's just unbelievable when you hear this kind of stuff that generals and admirals are getting shot and put under prison and on a regular basis you know okay fine you know some general admiral makes a makes a mistake line him up do what you want to fair enough but you can't do that regularly and here is a country that is sending a message that we are the superpower we are like a very strong military force and i wonder what it does to the morale within the armed forces of china I think, yes, uh, according to Yao Chen, the, the morale is very, very low. And everybody, is, especially because Xi Jinping has already started the big purge. So the top level uh, generals, uh, including the ordinary uh, soldiers, they have very low morale. They, they, were, they were generally, they were very afraid of really confronting the U.S. Army because they, they know they, they don't have a chance to win the war. And uh, uh, because we all know the CCP actually has not fought a real war for many, many years. And uh, they, they, I think the army system was very, very corrupt. Since Jiang Zemin's time, somehow he allowed the, the army 
uh, to 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 do business as well. So many mm-hmm. army generals are doing business, doing companies, doing their own, own, own industry. And uh, you can buy a, a general's title with money. So it was very, very corrupt. So that's why after Xi Jinping took over, he actually executed, I think, one, one of the uh, vice chairman of the central military uh, army. And he purged a lot of person because the corruption within the army was astonishing and he was very angry that so he used anti-corruption the name to purge i think there was one called guo guo xiong there's another one it's like uh xu cai hou there were both uh vice president or vice chairman of the Central Military Commission of the CCP. So his perch is to that top level. But I think even uh, although the CCP really invested a lot on building on a strong army uh, so that to prepare to not only fight Taiwan, but also to fight the U.S. because they know if they want to take Taiwan, they have to confront the U.S. as well, especially now the U.S. is very clear that they will defend Taiwan once the CCP if if want to use force to take Taiwan. So on the one hand, they are building up, you know, investing heavily in building up, you know, more ships, more missiles, and even more nuclear missiles. But on the other hand, the corruption is very, very rampant inside the army. And like, yes, like you said, the morale is, is very low. And also there is another recent very interesting incident where the chief AI military uh, scientist mm-hmm. called uh, Guo Yanghe, uh, he, you know, he was said to have died in a car accident. But at 2.35 a.m. in the morning. So, so that caused a lot of suspicion, you know, what, and, uh, and, you, and they, they used the, the Chinese word, Xi Sheng, in his, you know, when he announced his uh, death. Xi Sheng in Chinese means you sacrifice yourself to the war, to, to, uh, for in the country or during the war or, you, or you are killed by an any by the enemy, so so people have you know suspicion that he was not actually died in a car accident because he was the number one AI scientist. He he developed a a core a, a war brain system, which can you know using AI technology to. Uh, not only monitor the all situation in the war, but also maybe it is also a decisions and to all at least to assist the decision make a uh, process during the war. And so his uh, system is the most advanced in China and it won the competition. Uh, uh, nat- nationwide competition twice. Uh, so he was regarded as the number one AI military uh, expert, and he was uh, involved in creating or, uh, a strategy or tactic to attack Taiwan. And uh, he um, was, you know, also the number one person to, uh, in terms of military simulation. So his sudden death regard, was regarded as very suspicious, and it's beca- and especially the time of his of his death was it's two thirty five a.m. in the morning. So 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 nobody actually really uh, believed he would die in a car accident because uh, uh, be, uh, uh, and also they said it's he called a uh, a uh, DD. It's like a Uber in, Amer- in America. It's a rider hailing a service. It's something like taxi. They say because mm. he is a number one AI military AI scientist in, in China. If and and they also uh, especially announced 
he sacrificed he sacrificed himself during the process of committing uh, uh, executing a major mission. So what is that major mission that he has to work overnight to accomplish? So people think people said for a person like him, he should have a dedicated car. And if he's working, oh, driver, 30, yeah, yeah, two thirty uh, two thirty five a.m. So so my. Uh, speculation is he was, you know, the CCP may be working over time to create a plan to attack Taiwan because he was the third number one AI military expert. So he was involved in that kind of plan. But while he died suddenly and uh, his death was uh, described as a sacrifice. So my guess is he could be assassinated or killed or, or the, the opponent inside the army who want to stop the Xi Jinping, put, to stop Xi Jinping's plan, maybe create an accident or assassinate him somehow uh, to, to slow down the process. So that's, that's my speculation and many people's speculation because uh, the circumstances around his death was very strange and mysterious. Mm -hmm. And also another thing very strange is he also he he's the number one scientist, but his funeral uh, ceremony was held in Babao San uh, funeral home, and Babao San was uh, according to the CCP's regulation only military minister and above the high level CCP, a funeral can be held in Babaoshan. That's only for very high level CCP leaders. He is only, a, I think, oh. a professor. Yeah, a professor. Mm. Yes, yes. His, his level was very low. It's his, and also he's very young. He's on, only in his 30s, 38 or something. So, so although he he is a, he was an expert, his official level was not high enough for his funeral to be held in Baba San. So, why they treat him so differently? He must be involved in something really, really like the like his uh, a military said major uh, task. But they only mention he was the leader of certain projects and a certain mission but they didn't disclose what kind of mission was. So his days also uh, raised doubts whether there are some kind of faction or personnel inside the CCP military force that want to slow down or stop Xi Jinping's ambition to attack Taiwan. So that's a, a, another very interesting development within the military system. I mean, one can't help figure out why these kind of stuff will happen. There's no other explanation for it. You can't yeah. have four admirals just being taken out of a rocket force. One yeah. general being removed of a, out of a strategic support force. One of yes. your leading scientists just dying in the middle of the road at 2.35 in the morning. Yeah. Fair enough, he could have been drunk, he could have this and that, but such a high-level guy should have had a car, should have yes. had a driver, should have had a and China is supposedly a very rich country. I'm sure it can afford yes. a car for its best scientist, you know. It's it's a very, yes. very weird uh, And they said the, 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 his car was sandwiched by a, by a bus and a cement ah. uh, traffic truss. So you know, there was no bus running at, at 2 a.m. in the morning. So, so that's also raised people's doubts. What do Chinese people say about all this stuff? I'm sure they know what's happening. They're not stupid. What do they say amongst themselves? I mean, what happened here? Uh, I think there were different kind of, there be so, so, you know, China is so huge. So there are different kind of people. Not everybody, everybody think the same. But a recent, I think, very interesting uh, uh, like like survey, online survey reveal a lot of people's true thoughts. The survey was something like uh, launched by a, by a website saying uh, if uh, a war started uh, or, or whatever, uh, when the country or your motherland need you to defend 
uh, the country to go to a war? Are you willing to to hold a gun to go to the or front line to defend your country? You know, you will be surprised. Many people replied. Of course, they they don't disclose the real name. They 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 log in with anonymous names like the internet that handles. Somebody says, yes, I would like to go to a war. Give me the gun, give me the bullet. And I know who is our real enemy. And <laughs> no real enemy will be escaped from my gun. And some others say, uh, if the war break out, I, I will guard against the airport so nobody can escape. So he's indicating if a war really breaks out, all the CCP would want to leave China to escape, and he will guard against at the airport to make sure that no CCP leaders would be able to escape from China. And those people say, we know who the real uh, enemies are. We, we will shoot them <laughs> all. <laughs> so everybody know if, if, if you mean the U.S. soldiers or the Taiwanese are our enemies. You don't have to say real enemies. So real enemies actually means they really CCP leaders. So they, they say, we, we know uh, who the real enemies are. We will, we will shoot them all. So all these kind of responses, uh, the overwhelming majority of the responses are, are this kind of response and they got hundreds of likes. So that revealed that a lot of, like you said, Chinese people know what's going on. And really, a war breaks out between the US uh, and China or Taiwan and China. Uh, the, there, there is a real chance that many of the people may well turn around to their gun and shoot at their real enemies not the U.S. soldiers. So that's another, that's I think, the risk that Xi Jinping will have to consider. That's very scary because I, you know, uh, whatever said and done, you know, one really wonders the factor that there is, there is, of course, a level of understanding within, within, within China that talks about uh, how this thing should be taken forward in case something happens. Okay, so there, there's this thing. But you know, one of the biggest questions that I have is that when a country needs to go through a revolution, you know, to remove the CCP would need nothing short of a revolution. You need a counter think... leadership. You need somebody to stand up and, you know, say, okay, I'll fight against the CCP. With the kind of controls China has, how will that happen? Yeah, that, that is very, very hard. But I think China is quickly approaching to the point where everybody or more and more things are happening and that more and more people are feeling very, very unhappy with the government. Yes, but when and how they can organize themselves and stop, uh, stand up together to fight back together, that is, yes, a very big issue. But there could be a uh, possibility like somebody within the CCP who already has a lot of resources, especially inside the army. If a general really has this kind of courage, he may be able to do that. For ordinary citizens it is really very very hard they are all isolated they are like us uh, isolated you know everyone is isolated a single individual so it is very hard to do anything but the point i think uh the high pressure point the the ccp has reached now is amazing like now uh, the the World U University game is is held in Chengdu City, right? You don't know how crazy the security uh, measures are. Like last time in Suzhou, when Xi, Xi Jinping was visiting, they even confiscated people's gas cylinder they used to cook because gas cylinder could be used as a 
uh, uh, explosive device. So they took away uh, residents' gas cylinder, and the government had to deliver food to them. Now in Chengdu, they are doing the same. They are asking uh, residents in a certain round of of uh, area to reduce the frequency of going out, and the government is deliver, delivering food, grocery stuff for them, so they don't need to go out. And uh, during the opening ceremony, they were not even allowed to open uh, the windows. And uh, if you drive a Tesla car, you are not allowed to approach certain kind of street. They are still, I think, afraid a Tesla car will connect data and transmit it to US because Tesla is owned by Elon Musk in US, right? So all sorts of crazy security uh, measures. Uh, so you will wonder, no any regime can maintain this kind of level of security. Oh, oh yes, Xi Jinping has 300 bodyguards and uh, involved as his security work involved 8,000 police and uh, armed force police and plus 300 bodyguards just to defend himself. So you see in a, in a democratic country, I say like the president of Taiwan, Tsai Ing-wen, she was, you know, in in a in a subway. She took a bus, you know, go to work by herself, and nobody carry anything for her. And in in Western countries, you can also see, you know, these big political figures, you know, go to shaking hands with public. But Xi Jinping has three hundred bodyguards and eighty thousand police, you know, involved in the security only for himself, not include all the, you know, uh, events security. And uh, so this, I don't think any kind of a regime or country can maintain this kind of crazy uh, kind of security to this kind of level. It will collapse one way or the other sooner or later. One word, insanity. You know, uh, the, <laughs> yes. the, the, just the factor that I'm sure people sit in their living room and talk about it, you know, two families get yeah. together having a beer, they say, you know, what's, this, what's wrong with these people? I'm sure people are talking about it, but I wonder what, if anything will happen. You know, I want to come to a point where we will now start discussing about a, a video that you did on your channel. Mm -hmm. With regards to, <clears throat> excuse me, the expose of Wuhan, uh, you spoke to a scientist and he's, I mean, he said some really mind boggling things. Yes. Somewhere down the line, heart of hearts, we knew those things were right. But then listening to him was, I mean, not yes. very comforting, if I may say that. What, what did he say? And I'm sure you spoke to him offline as well. What else did he say? Uh, how how do you kind of analyze this? Uh, actually, uh, yes, I was actually approached by this scientist through his friend uh, back in 2020, 2021. Wow. And he said he got direct uh, confession, you can say, from a researcher of Wuhan Institution of Virology whose name is Shan Chao. And the Shan Chao told him some astonishing facts. The, of course, the first one was Shan Chao said he was given four strains of coronavirus, he and his team, in February 2019 to test and to, to screen, to select one that can infect as many species as possible. So Shan Chao's team tested those four completed strain of coronavirus on different animals, and then they delivered the result in May of uh, June in 2019. And the Shan Chao uh, clearly called this the coronavirus as a bioweapon, and they are uh, lamp engineered and all already completed 
So his task was just to select the best one. So that was the most astonishing or shocking revelation and the first time ever that we got a direct, uh, you can say, confession and admission from a researcher in Wuhan Institute, Institute of Virology. Although, like you said, we suspected uh, the lab is doing something and we suspected the pandemic, the virus started either in intentionally or a, a leak from the lamp. Although we knew that or we suspected that, but this time this is the first time ever that it was confirmed by a researcher of Wuhan Institute of Virology himself. So he actually uh, confessed this to my interviewee in March 2020. That was when the pandemic first started in China and in Wuhan. And he saw many people dying around him. So he felt very, very guilty. And in that kind of mental status, he felt a, a great uh, amount of mental pressure and uh, and because he felt great great guilty he i think it's just in a a kind of emotional moment and impulse he revealed these facts to my interviewee who later on uh, revealed this to me and uh, so so that was most you know shocking i, I uh, and i also asked my interviewee um can Shan Chao, you know, be sure that uh, the one that caused the, the death of so many people in Wuhan was exactly the one that he researched or studied? He said yes, because in February 2020, the gene sequence of the coronavirus, of the COVID, was already released or published uh, online. So he said, Shan Chao, as a scientist, as a virologist, and also as someone who had studied this virus for such a long time, as soon as he see this sequence, he, he know what that it is. He is a professional, so he, he know what he was talking about. So that's what my interviewee told me. So another very piece of shocking, uh, you can say, information or allegation was, he said, San Chao told him that during the 2019 World uh, Military Game in Wuhan, uh, several of San Chao's colleagues went missing from the normal work um, po stations or post. And later on, one of them told San Chao that they were sent to the hotels that of the athletes from other countries to check the hygiene conditions. So when San Chao heard this, his, his, his thought was, you don't need a virologist to, to check yeah. the hygiene <laughs> or health condition of the hotel. So his yeah. speculation was, they were sent there to spread the virus or do some kind of things that related to the virus because they were all, they were they are all virologists. Of course, he is. Uh, the my interviewee said the either uh, San Chao himself had any solid evidence. So the only fact is several of his. Uh, San Chao's colleague went missing during the games, and one of the, them told San Chao they were sent to the hotel to check, you know, the, the hygiene conditions. So that was San Chao's suspicion. So, uh, and then uh, the third very astonishing information he disclosed was uh, in April 2020, San Chao actually sent a message while he was on a plane that was going to fly from Wuhan to Xinjiang. And the, the term he used again is he was sent there to check the health conditions of the in inmates who were detained in the re-education camp of these Uyghurs. So again, uh, when my interviewee saw this, saw this message, he understood he must 
be sent there to do something that is related to the virus. Again, you don't need a virologist to check the no. health condition of the image. You send a doctor if you really want to check the health uh, uh, condition of the image. So again, my interviewee believed Shan Chao was sent there either to spread the virus or to observe how the virus was working on weaker population. So that was very, very astonishing revelation from my interviewee. He, he told me this in uh, September 2021, but because of safety consideration, I was only able to release it recently. So this, this, this scientist is still in China? I, I can't uh, disclose the, his okay. personal Fair information enough. to yeah to Fair protect. Enough. That's Fair why I I delayed it's, so yeah. I mean it's so amazing. I'm sure some more people know what happened. And yeah, but I yeah I released the video recently. I think everybody can go to my channel and uh, to to watch it. And I I think most people after you watch it you will be convinced this. This scientist that I interviewed, I, I felt because I, I had, uh, before my interview with him in English, I had, I had a long, long conversations with him in Chinese for over three hours. So I, I felt he was very sincere and he was honest. He, he knew what he was talking about. And, uh, and so I think what he said is, uh, convincing to me. That's why I interviewed him and released this interview. So I, I think this uh, this information is so important. So everyone should at least take a look. And then, of course, this is only uh, you can say you can either say indirect or direct uh, piece of evidence. But of course, at least we have one more piece of you know information there. We can like uh, really there is a big big puzzle. But every every time we got something new, we can connect with all other information we've already gathered, and uh, in the end, we hopefully we can connect all the dots together and uh, to find out and figure out exactly how this thing that has killed millions of people in the entire world, yeah. how it started. Something released or leaked um, by the CCP, they should be held accountable. It's amazing. And I'm sure the world's intelligence agencies know what has exactly happened. Of course, uh, it's amazing. Yeah. It's just amazing that this thing is still still under wraps. I want to talk to you about coming back to the army. You know, uh, does Xi Jinping keep them in regular exercise to keep them busy? Right now, also, there's supposed to be an exercise in the South China Sea again. So yes, does he keep I, them in action all the time so that they're just busy with something or the other all the time and he can track their movements that way? I think that is maybe only one of the purpose. Another purpose is I think Xi Jinping is purposely increasing the level of tension in the area. And every time he moved a little bit forward, Taiwan has to move, move a little bit backwards. So he's inching, uh, you can say, his advancement in this military uh, position so that he has more room uh, to move around. Another purpose is I think he wants to increase the psychology pressure of the Taiwanese people. Like the Taiwanese people feel, oh, it's so dangerous. They they are, you know, their mm. military uh, airplay uh, are, are surrounding us every day because Taiwan is going to have a uh, election very soon. And one of the parties, one of the major parties, uh, you know, uh, their major slogan is peace. They're, they're, uh, they want to, they want, their main, main message to the public is if you elect us, 
we can make a peace deal with the CCP yeah. and the mm -hmm. CCP will stop, you know, uh, doing this. So I think the CCP want to help this party, let, let's name it, it's Nationalist or Kuomintang Party to win Kuomintang. the election. Yeah, so actually the CCP's best choice or best case scenario to take Taiwan is not by force. It's to just to uh, maintain en enough mental pressure so that uh, the, the Taiwan these, the Taiwan people are too afraid of starting a war against Taiwan and they voluntarily elected a party which is willing to negotiate with the CCP to reach something like similar with Hong Kong. We can have one country to two system. We can maintain our current, you know, our social status, but we, we, we can be united with our great motherland without, you know, fighting without a war. And if you elect the uh, uh, Min Jindang, which uh, I think it's a democratic progressive party, uh, the CCP will, will attack us, so that's dangerous. So I think it's not just to keep them busy. This is their, I think, master, uh, one of their master plan. Uh, on the one hand, they are preparing to take Taiwan with with force, uh, a military attack. But on the other hand, I think they are increasing the tension, uh, the, uh, the level of tensions, want to test the reaction of Taiwanese people and also the U.S. military, how they would uh, react and how, how quick they would react and also to give mental pressure to the Taiwanese people to try to influence the election result. If they have their their own selected party win the election, they may be able to so-called unify Taiwan without a war or a fight for them to voluntarily negotiate in some kind of similar like system with Hong Kong or me mechanism with Hong Kong. And then if that uh, that re realized the, C the CCP can claim they have already take back Taiwan. So so I think this this option or this scenario is actually what at least the Taiwan people should be very, very careful and uh, a guard against, uh, uh, of course, prepare for a war is necessary, but also I think this is more dangerous and is more, I think, uh, and the, the best choice at least for the CCP, the lowest, the, the most efficient with the lowest cost. But of course, the cost will be Taiwan's freedom if they don't realize or recognize the CCP's tactic, they could be really fall into the CCP's trap. You don't think they do recognize? Uh, I think it's it's hard to say. A lot of Taiwan Taiwanese media were all already uh, bought over by the CCP or influenced or heavily infiltrated. And the CCP has a huge army to influence their online speech, online public opinion. So many people, I, th I think, were heavily influenced by, by the CCP. And for the, the last election, if it's not because of the, Hong the CCP's crackdown on Hong Kong in 2019, I think the the candidate Han Guoyu of the Kuomintang was almost won that election. If if the CCP had not cracked down on uh, suppressed the Hong Kong people so badly, that that would wake up a lot of Taiwanese people. That's why in each, in the end, Tsai Ing Wen end. But before the the Hong Kong incident, Han Guoyu is, you can say, his prosperity to win the, the election was huge. So if the CCP didn't do what they did to Hong Kong, that candidate could have already won the 2020 election. And if that happens, we can say the CCP could have already 
take over Taiwan peacefully. Fantastic. I want to ask you one last question. You know, the my theory again coming back to the point that if if in case something needs to be done to the CCP, uh, because you know a lot of people talk about. So let me just say this: there are two parts of this question. A lot of people talk about removing Xi Jinping. I mean, I have a serious problem with that because removing Xi Jinping doesn't solve anything. No,、uh, it does not. The 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 next guy can be worse. Yes. That's part one, and part two is let's say okay, you talk about you know going against the CCP. One internally, China doesn't have an opposition leader that can you know this thing. And you mentioned there could be someone who could come out and do something, but as a as a community in the world. How do you convince, or how do you reach out to the Chinese people itself and tell them what is happening in their country? And that's because that's the big challenge, you know. Yes, I、out. actually I have always、uh, trying to、um, I can't say promote an idea. They、mm. they wished the U.S. Congress should just pass a law or a reg- or a bill than to tear down the CCP's firewall. It's very easy. It's not that expensive, and it's technically possible. And if we we only make a very small compared to the to this expense of a war, that the expense to tear down the CCP's firewall is very very little, and that doesn't cost any like human lives of the U.S. soldiers. If they tear down the CCP's firewall. And、uh, enable the CC the Chinese people have free access to free information all around the world, and let them recognize what the CCP has done and their tactic, and、uh, and even let them realize the sufferings of their fellow Chinese people. Because like Falun Gong practitioners, they were killed for their organs, but most of the Chinese people maybe still don't know this. So if they can have a, a they, let's say maybe only two weeks of free access to the to the all the information that is already out there, maybe I think the CCP will collapse in no time. And this is the most I think cost effect efficient. Way of help, you know. We don't have to re- really go into China and to fight the CCP's our monstrous army. We still think they are very powerful, but the best way is to tear down the CCP's great firewall and enable the Chinese people to have free access of the, the information and to let the C- Chinese people see through the evil nature of the CCP and see that they have this、uh, the the support of the the whole world behind them if they really want. To fight for their freedom, I believe something will happen, and、uh, there will be a lot of Chinese people.、Uh, like, at least if they can have free access of social media apps of the overseas, which is free of the Chinese、uh, people, the CCP's monetary and、uh, you know control, they can easily using you know、uh, safe and free. Internet, you know, like chat apps to organize them, them. Like I know now, Telegram, like all the like Twitter, like all like Facebook, Instagram, all overseas apps were forbidden in China. So if they can have free access, they the firewall can tear down. They will figure out ways to organize themselves, to organize events, and to maybe quickly form a party even. A political party or political organizations, and to, I think the the Chinese people, most of them are already fed up by all the atrocities the CCP is bringing them. We see so many people are trying to enter U.S. illegally. A lot of them are very high level, you know, social figures. It was it is unimaginable in China. It's it's. It is to the point of how bad the situation、uh, in China is. So those people have lost any confidence in China's future. So that's why they risk their life. They abandon all what they already have in China to risk their lives or their families' lives to 
try to enter uh, US illegally. So I think the situation is already that bad. Uh, instead of trying to, you know, uh, figure out uh, what or uh, when the CCP would attack Taiwan, I think the West should uh, proactively tear down the great firewall of the CCP. And that needs only a little bit of money, a little bit of technology, which I think the US, actually some individuals already had that kind of uh, technology. Only uh, we need a little bit more investment to fight back, you know, you need to have at least enough servers for your service to help the Chinese people to to tear or to either jump over the firewall or tear down their firewall. And then I think a change could happen very, very quickly in China. Wow. I mean, it, it's 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 amazing that uh, stuff still yeah. happens like this. Yeah, we should yeah, we should work with the Chinese people together inside China. That's the yeah. I mean, those of them who are not part of the CCP, <laughs> I see yeah. a lot of Chinese people fighting with the with the residents in Australia and Canada for the CCP. So that's also amazing to me. Uh, there was there these there was this video that came out of Australia where one Taiwanese yes. guy was protesting. Yeah, and yes. Two Chinese guys could come and but beat him up, and we you know, it's, we it's, need to un we need to understand for all those Chinese people who are able to study overseas Chinese, they come from CCP's family, top families, because ordinary families can't afford to send their children to Australia, America. You need a lot of money, tuition fee and living expenses. So all these people were the children of the CCP officials. So they, of course, they were defend the CCP because all their money come from the CCP's power, but those people maybe only account for 5% of the population. The next 95% yeah. are with us, are with the freedom of the uh, are with the free world and uh, they are fed up with the CCP's suppression. But what we can see overseas, uh, only the top 5% of the CCP's uh, you know, children, they don't represent the real Chinese. Yeah, otherwise daddy will be out of a job very soon. Yeah, you know, if they don't, daddy will be out of a job, and there's no money after that, so that's gonna be a big yes. problem. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that tells you the superficiality of the CCP itself, how how deep they are in their thoughts, and if I may, the struggle that Mao referred to when he when he started the CCP. Ma'am, it's such a pleasure talking to you and learning from you because there are certain insights that we read, but we don't make two cents out of it. Um, you know, I hope that you get a lot more strength to do what you're doing, and you, uh, you know, you, you help us understand the mystery of China, and that's something which is, uh, which is really important for the region and the whole wide world because. Uh, if there is one threat that that emanates with regards to global safety, that is from China itself. It's not the military threat. It is the interference within the society uh, that the Chinese are able to do. Infiltration of the societies, of the politics, of the business uh, that they are able to do, that they are good at. So that's the main threat that we need to counter. And that can be done when we all coalesce and know about China and how to call them out when it's needed. So thank you so much for doing what you're doing. Uh, my request to all all the people who are going to be watching the show, please do check out her channel, follow her on Twitter. It's the same name, Inconvenient Fruits. Uh, she puts out some amazing stuff. I keep looking at it, and uh, you know, it's she put out a photograph recently of these cars, hundreds and thousands of cars parked in Wuhan, and asked the question, "Where did the drivers go?" <laughs> That's interesting. Either they all went off bye bye during COVID, or Somebody played a prank with regards to the, you know, the, the, the subsidy that they get for electric vehicles. So somebody bought a lot of vehicles and then took the subsidy and dumped the vehicles after that. So you never know. I mean, China is a weird place. Thank you so much once again to, to you know, for joining me on this show. And I hope to have you again sometime very soon for another insightful discussion. Till then, thank you. Thank you.